we met the group of us who founded a Women's Learning Partnership, we met at the conference in Beijing, the Fourth World Conference on Women. And, uh, you know, it was both a very miserable time and also a very happy time. It was miserable because the government of China didn't want us there at all. They were petrified of NGOs. They watched us every minute. They moved us to this crazy village uh, outside of Beijing that uh, had terrible uh, communications and uh, even just getting there. There was no one who around us who spoke English or could understand European languages. And uh, the village that we went to, Huairu, was a mess. There was mud all over the place. It rained all the time. There were these temporary toilets which were a hole in the ground. There was no food except some um, idea of the Chinese government about what Westerners would like to or other people would like to eat, which was some kind of a weird hamburger con concoction. And so from that point of view, it was, it was really miserable. Uh, we had uh, uh, sessions set up, and then we went and found other people in the rooms where we were supposed to be. There was no way to communicate. And uh, so it was just the height of misery. But from the other point of view, it was unbelievable. Uh, there were 35,000 uh, NGOs represented there. There was so much enthusiasm, so much excitement, so much dynamism. And everybody had ideas, everybody had hopes. And of course, we have to remember this was the fourth World Conference. So we had had uh, lots of chances to get together. And it was really enormously helpful to have the United Nations set up these conferences. Because at the beginning, the first one that I went to was in Mexico City in 1975. And there were only 800 uh, NGOs represented. And then up to 35,000 was really the result of these various conferences and how they made it possible for people to get together and to uh, establish networks, to establish uh, non-governmental organizations. And the funders were supportive. And so everything went, uh, you know, uh, toward more uh, networking and more uh, mobilization. So, uh, you know, a group of us, mostly from the Muslim majority countries who were there, kept thinking, okay, or, you know, why with all of this enthusiasm, with all of these active women, with all of this high spirits and self-sacrifice and so forth, why are women around the world still where they are, which is not a very good place? Well, why is there so much... Uh, poverty among women? Why is there so much um, inequality, injustice? Why are the laws so bad and so forth? And then, uh, you know, we had tons of meetings, brainstorming sessions late into the night, early in the morning, in the mud, in the dirt, everywhere. But um, and then we followed these meetings past Beijing for several uh, years following. And the thing that we came to, if I want to sum it up, was this, that unlike what we think, our issues, our challenges across the world are very similar. They may look different. The Chinese scene looks very different than the American or the Swedish scene. The African and the Middle Eastern look different. But the essential structure of organizations is the same almost everywhere, everywhere father knows best, everywhere the employer has all the power, everywhere the government dictates what gets done. Uh, in, uh, among people, the teacher knows people, students sit there and take notes. That is, it's the way that the uh, top-down hierarchical way that relations between human beings are organized. And this, at the essence, at the center of that, is the role of women, you know, because they are always next in line. They're always the secondary uh, group and so forth. And, and then also the way that women are kept in so-called their place are different in types of things that are uh, prescribed for them. But in the general idea behind it, it's very similar. For one thing, invisibility. 
you're not supposed to be too out, out there. Uh, in terms of decision making, you're not the one who makes most of the major decisions of life. Uh, in terms of uh, your, the control of your own body, the less the better. In terms of the image of your body, uh, it's something better hidden than out there. And then sometimes tradition and culture make it uh, uh, specifically uh, difficult in the sense that the Chinese, for instance, until really quite recently, had uh, the feet bound, the young girl's feet broken and bound so that they would have what's called the two-inch lotus feet, ba barely able to walk, you know. So mobility was that way uh, prevented. And in that way, of course, power is prevented. If you can't move uh, independently al fast, of course, it, it uh, uh, reduces a lot of uh, possibilities. There is, in parts of Africa, mutilation, female genital mutilation that deforms a, a young girl's body and, and, and uh, uh, makes it impossible for them to, to have any kind of reaction to, to uh, uh, sexual uh, or erotic feeling. That's another way to limit women in parts of the Muslim world. They cover women from top to toe with just a slit to get their eyes. So no matter where you look, there are attempts at limitation, uh, control over the body, limitation of options, and limitation of movement. So either physically, like the Chinese foot binding, or uh, just forbidding the movement of women in public spaces, segregation of women's movement in public spa spaces. So all of this has been the same everywhere. But then also we came, the group of us, to the conclusion that this is not some nasty old bad guys doing this to the women everywhere. There has been a reason behind it, and that reason has been the way the world works. Power was shared, not really shared, but taken because women weren't able to physically take some of the requirements of power, for instance, physical strength, which was very necessary, whether you were engaging in wars, conflict, or in physical labor, which was the way most people uh, paid for their living. And also, women were constantly pregnant. You know, it, it, uh, the health situation was such that basically uh, you had to have eight, nine, ten children to keep three of them alive. And you had to have children because they were the ones who were the help in terms of economic survival and sustenance. And they were also the people who take care of the older people when they get old, uh, older. So all of this is historical memory of how these things developed. And then to keep the system going, culture and religion and art and uh, politics and economics and even architecture of cities and uh, mostly small towns and villages where people lived, all were structured to keep the system going. And that's why it uh, has been sustained so long after it was no longer necessary. And actually, it's not so long. It's basically since the 20th century, where the Industrial Revolution became uh, changed the way of life. Uh, uh, people could work in factories, live in cities, where the pill was introduced, reproductive health became different. We, women were able to space their children and so forth. So all of this began changing in the 19th and, and 20th centuries, but still the system hasn't moved as fast as we wish to because basically uh, culture, tradition, everything, all aspects of life have gone to sustain this system. And women themselves, who are the makers of culture and the keepers of culture, have been both believers in this culture, thinking that's the natural way, the normal way to be. And they've also passed it on to the next generation, to their sons, how to be masculine, to their daughters, how to be feminine. So how do we do this? How do we change this situation? Because unless this changes, we're not going to have the world that we envision. So we thought we will get together, make an organization, and that organization 
will have as its secret mission to change the architecture of human relationships. Secret because it's such a big vision and we are, we are half a dozen countries, small group of people from these countries. To have that kind of ambition, it was a little bit ridiculous to come out and say it at the beginning. So what we started doing when you ask about manuals, and this is a long way to get uh, to that, uh, we began working together to discover how do we how do we learn together if we're not going to have hierarchical arrangements of power arrangements of relationships how are we going to learn to do it differently and we committed ourselves to the idea that what we would do is walk the talk we wouldn't oppose hierarchy, oppose authority, oppose uh, undue competition and all of that, but then engage in it ourselves. We wouldn't sit people around in a workshop and then lecture to them. That's how you should have relationships. We would work with people. We would provide a safe space so that people could get together. We would present to them an idea, a story, a narrative, almost always a real one. And then a decision that a woman made about her life, about the life of her family or about her community. And then we would have the people encourage that they would engage in discussing this. Since it was one step removed, it was easier for people to express themselves. And since no one was pushing them for a right answer, there was no right answer. Every answer was right. You know. So people got used to speaking out. They got used to expressing their opinion. They got used to not being afraid to have the wrong answer. And then a certain amount of creativity, innovation, dynamism generated from this interactions. The more they worked together, the safer they felt, and the easier it became for them to be articulate, to express uh, their ideas, to come up with new ideas, and gradually to unite around a thing they wanted to do. Something in their own lives, in their family's life, in the community that they wanted to do together. I never forget one of our um, uh, Iraqi uh, friends who was in, in one of the workshops explained to us that, you know, uh, I was uh, preparing lunch. My husband had uh, a guest, and he came to me and said, why don't you make some coffee? And I said, look, I'm busy. And he said, okay, I'll make it. I said, but you've never said that. And he said, you've never asked me. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea that you could ask your husband, go ahead and do it, you know. <laughs> is something that came up in the workshop. People said, you know, one of the things you can do, say what you want, say what you need, say what your idea is, say what your solution is, and then see if anyone pays attention. And if they don't, continue and, and, and persist and, and uh, convince. So it's a simple idea. The simple idea is that women working together in a space where they feel respected where they feel included, and where they feel as if they are agents of change, empowers people. And once they're empowered, they do miraculous things, even with very little resources and very little possibilities. So that's how our original uh, sort of signature curriculum was created. And it's called Leading to Choices, which starts from a woman and a session that says, how am I a leader in my own life? And moves from session to session to how do I lead an initiative? How do I get others to go along? How do I mobilize my community? And how do I create uh, an organization and so forth? In most uh, countries, especially in Muslim majority countries, laws have changed as Countries have changed as the world has changed, as modernization has come about. Nobody has any problems with laws regarding commerce, 
uh, or banking, or although there are some arguments about banking, but really no serious ones, or regulation of uh, 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 corporate uh, entities or any of that. But when it comes to women and the role of women, there's always a reference back to what the holy texts of the religion have said. And there are multiple interpretations of those holy texts. The, the four schools of Islam have very different ideas of what the texts actually mean. And family laws are the ones that, uh, in effect, uh, decide everything about women. What age you marry, whether you go to school or not. Uh, how do you uh, move from one place to another? Do you, you have permission? Who do you get permission from? At what age do you marry? Who gives you away, literally? Who is the person who decides to allow you to get married. You know, the right to divorce, which women generally don't have. Uh, the place of residence, whether you can have a job or not. All of this is within family laws. So in essence, uh, family laws dictate not only the style and the uh, manner of the life that a woman is allowed, but also the architecture of human life, because that's where it's decided how do people relate to each other. And for instance, the permission to travel is one piece of it. Just today we heard from Iran, for instance, that uh, a woman who was supposed to go and uh, participate in a soccer tournament abroad was not allowed to do that because her husband wouldn't allow her to get a, a passport, you know. So there's huge mobilization, uh, both internally and outside, to, to oppose this law. But it's very entrenched, and it exists in most uh, Muslim-majority countries, and it is part of the family law. We created this manual on human rights called Beyond Equality. We had the overall idea that even though we have started the women's movement in terms of fighting injustice and inequality, we started with wanting a right to education. We then went on specifically to a right put to political participation. And remember, we didn't have the right to participate in elections in the political system either as voters or elected officials until the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. The United States didn't give women the right to vote until 1920. And strangely enough, Switzerland didn't until 1970. So this is not all uh, old history, it's very new. So we fought at first for identifying uh, abuses I, I, and identifying injustice and, and oppression. And then after that moved along, that uh, uh, set of assertions, set of uh, demands started moving along and, and succeeding. Oh, I remember in the 1993 uh, Human Rights Conference in Vienna, we came with the concept of women's rights are human rights. Because even though human rights were in the beginning, in the French Revolution, in the American Revolution, almost everything started with all men are created equal. It took a long time before women would be considered human or the word men would encompass humanity. So, uh, and even the French Revolution, you know, fraternity uh, was the idea of brotherhood rather than anything having to do with females. So it took a long while until 1993 when we actually had the United Nations Conference say women's rights are human rights. And then following that, we started the slogan 50-50. We want to be equal 50% of what exists, whether it's employment, whether it's uh, spaces, whether it's opportunities, 50-50. And then, of course, a lot of consciousness raising, a lot of mobilization efforts, a huge amount of activism went into the situation where, at least at the level of consciousness raising, there's hardly a corner of the world where women's rights has not been 
put forward as an important topic. It has been interpreted in different ways and different solutions have been suggested, but the consciousness has been raised. And in certain places, of course, women are serving at the highest levels of government and business and the arts and so forth, even though terrific abuses still exist everywhere and especially in some parts of the world. But what we are thinking now is that we are living in a pretty miserable world. Human rights is in a very poor state. From the place where we thought we had moved forward considerably, had generally agreed to declarations, conventions that spelled out exactly the rights of all human persons, and that was an agreed for agreed uh, supposition, we have, because of terrorism, because of the wars that we have undergone and so forth, we have come to a point where the most basic rights are being stepped upon even by the most advanced countries. So we don't want 50% of that, especially since we have really had very little choice in making the 100%. So now we want to go beyond equality. Now we want to go and shape the 100%. And having looked at the history and having stopped blaming men for the circumstances rather than the infrastructure, we really want to work with men to move our uh, activism toward a vision that is inclusive of all, which is a better vision, and especially inclusive of the young who are the future of the world. So. That's why we call the manual Beyond Equality, and that's why our new mobilization effort is focused on youth, and that's why we dearly hope that they will be the ones who give shape to the world we seek. For the first time in history, we have enough uh, scientific discoveries that have done away with most of the major diseases of mankind. We have enough industrial advancement and technological advancement to do away with poverty across the world. We have all sorts of possibilities uh, right now. We've experimented with so many forms of together, working together, community building, governance, and so forth. I think what we need is the will, the collective will to do something about all this. I, I think if there is a danger in our world is complacency in some and a feeling of, let's say, uh, uh, hopelessness or pessimism or indifference in others. But there is also a huge wave of concern. Uh, for instance, the movement in the United States Black Lives Matter is reinventing uh, the civil rights movement, which was one of the most extraordinary efforts of human organizing and human rights activism. So this is going back and reigniting that. And I think that the women's movement also, which is one of the most, the strongest movements, strongest networks around the world, redefining itself uh, as a more inclusive and a more holistic uh, and a more courageous effort by women, not to just think of what they lack, but to think of where humanity needs to go. I think they have huge ideas and, and wonderful solutions to many of our problems. And some of the uh, historical experience of women, which has been nourishing, which has been consensus building, which has been uh, getting together with others and getting things done in a peaceful manner. I think all of that is something that could be used on, in, in addition to the terrific skills that women have picked up and, and have learned and have used. I think all of that uh, is a fantastic uh, component uh, in, in making the new world we want to make. So I, I'm very optimistic. And, and I think uh, the incredible group of young people who are so connected now across the globe through technology, through education, we have every reason to believe that all we need to do is really believe in it and we will change it.
change the world. Many of our partners come from places where wars are raging. There are so many refugees. Children are being washed ashore because their parents are seeking a safe space for them. There's so much waste of, of, of human resources that instead of being spent or used for human security, are used for military security. There is so much uh, extremism, so much aggression going on in the world. We really, it's about time that we pulled our resources together, stop blaming each other, sharing the blame, but also sharing the credit for where we are, and start rethinking again. The way that Eleanor Roosevelt led people to work together from 60 different countries at the time to put down the Declaration of, in, uh, of our, uh, Human Rights and bring an agreement on that, I think it's time to do that again, you know, to, to get an international movement that is about a new vision of the world. There is opposition, just as there was for Eleanor Roosevelt and that group that first began, and that diverse group, diverse countries who worked with her and, and uh, created the declaration. There is a lot of opposition. There are those who like to say that there are one set of uh, rights for one type of people and another set of rights for others. Um, it's really, in our experience, in the partnerships experience, nonsense. We have had meetings in every corner of the world, wherever we have sat with women and asked, what do you want for your daughters? It's a better question than to say, what do you want for yourself? Because they more freely express their hopes. There has not been in one of those meetings that after a couple of hours of dialogue, we don't come up with all of the items, every article of the Human Rights Declaration. There's nobody who doesn't want the right to work, nobody who doesn't want the right to freedom of expression, nobody who doesn't want to move freely from one place to another, or to have sustenance, or to have the right to citizenship, or uh, a home to call their own, uh, or to move where they wish. All of those are things that human beings share. Religion is something that's been posited as an obstacle. It is not, it should not be an obstacle. Religion should be an inspiration for rights, not an obstacle. All religions have a reaffirmation of many of the ideas in the Declaration of Human Rights. So no matter where you go, no matter what religion or what ethnicity people are from, their basic needs are the same. Some people talk about, let's say, the Iranian young people, as if they spend every moment of their life trying to figure out what exactly did the Quran say in this and that relationship, or what did the Hadith say, or the uh, stories about the life of the Prophet said. Young people in Iran, like young people everywhere else, are worried about their education, worried about their housing, worried about uh, who they're going to marry, whether they're going to have the right amount of uh, money to support them, all sorts of interests, music, fun, food. Also, at the base of it, very importantly, their beliefs, those who do believe, and many of them do, the majority do. But life is not summed up in any one religion. That's the base value by which people live. But expressing themselves, they need all of the human rights that they know they own, and they feel they own, and they want to uh, achieve. And uh, nobody should be either penalized for being members of a particular religion in terms of rights and their achievement, nor they should they be spe specially favored at the price of other religions. Uh, because most communities are multi-religious. They um, uh, have uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, believers within their society, and there should be room for all. And that's why it's so important to have secularism as the base, because the fact of the matter is, in order to be able to have freedom of religion, you should have inclusion of all believers, no matter which religion they belong to. And in order to have that, you cannot have laws on the basis of one particular religion. And that's all secularism means, freedom of belief and freedom of exercise of their rights as a citizen, both of them at the same time.